I guess you are able to see my presentation now. Yes, we can see your books. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. So um, I would like to talk about pal public palliative care education. And we have been trying to do this with last eight courses for almost five years. Um, just short on my personal background, I'm an associate professor in palliative care at the University of Southern Denmark, and I'm a consultant in palliative medicine. But 35 years ago, I started my career as being a paramedic, and I've been working as an anesthesiologist and pain therapy um, for many years before I switched to palliative medicine for 15 years ago. So that's why I'm both working in emergency medicine and in palliative medicine. Yeah, I, just some things about today's lecture. I would like to start a bit on the background. I would like to talk about first aid and last aid, and then I would like to introduce you to the last aid project. And thereafter, tell you something about what do we already know about it from the scientific point of view. And then I would love to point out some future perspectives for the last eight courses too. So we could start and we could ask the people, where do you want to die? So, and if you do that, usually most people will, would say, I would love to die at home, which is true for about 60 up to 80%, depending on which study from which country you're looking at. So in the beginning, there, there is the wish to die at home. But if we look at current practice, we do know that most people in the European countries, at least, die in a hospital setting. So what can we do about that? We will come back to that point later. If you look at this, if you, if you see that, if you see a car accident or if you see people having a heart attack, what would you usually do? And this is, this is true both for us being a doctor or some, someone else. So what, what are we going to do as human beings? We're going to provide first aid. That's what we are doing. So that's everybody's job. Everybody has to provide first aid. And if we look at these situations, we see a seriously ill people living at home or dying people living at home. What should we all be able to do? I think it's quite easy because we all should be able to provide last aid. And last aid is including many things. And it's very often it's the little things that can make a big difference. It's just being there or reading or yeah, holding company, something like that, or trying to relieve pain with acupressure. So there are many things people actually can do. Ellen Kelleher said once, end of life care is everyone's responsibility. So from a public health point of view, we can say it's not us, the specialists who provide palliative care. It has to be a cooperation between specialists and between the public. So everyone has to do it. Back to emergency medicine, you can say, when I was a young doctor, I was visiting Seattle and learning, learning about CPR there. And actually it's like that, you have the best chance to survive a heart attack and, um, and a cardiac arrest in Seattle. And why is that? The reason for that is that they have been really interested in providing education for citizens. And actually they started in 1971 and have shown by that that public involvement is really crucial and it may lead to empowerment of the people. If you look at Germany, it was, it was like that, that the hospice movement was the people's movement. So the citizens wanted to, to provide palliative care at home. And I think in order to do that, they need some education. So let's go back to emergency medicine. And here you see the chain of survival, Norwegian style. And um, you can easily see it's really important that people do something. And it's not the specialist at the end of the chain of survival. It's the one who starts the chain of survival. So it's the people in the community. And knowing that, I started to, to say we should have a chain of palliative care too where it is about the same. We do have citizens that need basic knowledge of palliative care, and they should be able to recognize the need for palliative care and then contact general practitioners, nurses or whatever, or the community paramedic as we have seen before. The aim of this chain of palliative care is of course, to ensure best possible quality of life. Yeah, then in 2008, I proposed this model in, in a master thesis I, I did then. 
and uh, I started to do certain so to address the last eight course, which is based on some very short and important issues. It's very important to recognize dying as a part, as a normal part of human life. And we should address some common problems, how people can treat that. And we should see about fluid and nutrition at the end of life. And of course, we should talk about bereavement and grief. I come to that again. We created later an international working group from Norway, Denmark, and Germany. And then we created a short last aid course, which includes four modules. Each module is 45 minutes only. And it's about care at the end of life. It's about advanced care planning and decision-making. The third module is about symptom management and the fourth about death and bereavement. Practical aspect is the teaching is done within one day, usually within an afternoon or an evening. It's done by, certain, by two certified instructors. One of them is a nurse or a physician working in palliative care. Usually there are eight to 20 participants and it's provided by lectures and discussions and everything. And the course can be done in different places. It has been done in churches, hospices, schools, or wherever people are. Here you can see some of the contents of the modules. So we are really talking about when does dying start? We're talking about how can we care for, for people? We are talking about the basics of hospice philosophy and palliative care. And in module two, we are talking about advanced care planning. How can we do that and how, what, what makes sense? The third module is mainly about relieving suffering. Here we are, we are talking about symptoms as breathlessness or pain or nausea and what can we do about it. But we also talk about eating and drinking and why is it so important for us as human beings and what, is, what shall we do if people stop eating and drinking? So people have to understand that this is quite normal. And the fourth module is about final goodbyes. It's about to say farewell. It's about what can I do if some, someone has died in his own home? Whom shall I ring? And about rituals after death and all this. So far, we can see in the German speaking countries, Austria, Switzerland, and Germany, more than 30,000 citizens have done the course. And we already have 2,500 instructors. We do an evaluation on three different levels. So we have a, a questionnaire for the course participants. We do regularly interviews with the instructors in focus groups, and we do have an international last aid working group looking at the, at the slides and at the curriculum. Yeah, and the work was ongoing since 2013. So on the first step, you can see here, we created an international and multinational working group and tested the course. The next step between 2017 and 2018 was to make a in, in more international project where we aim to have six to 10 European countries. And the third step is ongoing now. So we have an expansion at present. You find last eight courses already in 18 countries, including South America, Brazil, and Australia. And we are still expanding and trying to, to get the courses to other countries too. The European Association for Palliative Care has established an EAPC task force on public palliative care education and last aid. Yeah, and from the start, we have tried to, to, to get knowledge and to, to spread knowledge about it. So we did some conferences for all the instructors. And the last one was an online conference due to COVID in October, where we had 174 participants from 18 countries. If we go back to the scientific evaluation of the project, we started already in 2015 with the first courses and did a pilot evaluation of the first three courses where we had 55 participants. They were aged between 21 and 82. And interestingly, 95% um, returned a questionnaire. And what did the participants think about the course? Most of them appreciate, appreciated it that it was a total natural way to deal with death and dying and found it easy to talk about death and dying in the group. Most of them appreciated also that it was clear and structured. So most people think it's good to talk about it. They like the open discussions and um, 
as I used to say, talking about death and dying does not hurt. And this is what the people learn during the course. Yeah, the course has been awarded in 2015 from the German Association for Palliative Medicine, and we were invited to Angela Merkel, as you can see. So um, after that, we, we tried to do more scientific research about it. We asked people, what do you associate with the term last aid? And most citizens would find it normal as a supplement to first aid. Some would know, wouldn't, wouldn't know what it is. They would, would say what? Most would say care at the end of life and bringing death and dying back into society. Yeah. In the last two years, we also have introduced the last aid course for kids and children. And in this year, we have published a paper um, looking at 128 children between nine and 17 years doing a last aid course for them. And they really appreciate it. They appreciate talking about death and dying. And here you can see a slide where we're talking about feelings and where we usually use a, use a play where the people, where the children can choose if you're frightened or whatever, what, what, which, which um, emoji would you choose then? So, and, th and then we have a discussion about feelings and we do have a discussions about that. You may have different feelings at one time. So that's really interesting with the children. And if you look at the evaluation, there were also 94% took part in the evaluation. 94% found the course useful for everyone and 92 would recommend it to others. So it's really working. Yeah, we have an ongoing project with, which is under review where we have been looking about more than 4,400 participants from the German speaking countries in Austria, Germany and Switzerland. And as you easily can see on the slides, it's mostly women attending the course. So, uh, and the median age is 56. My, this might suggest that we are talking about people who have to, be, have to give care to others at the end of life. So we really have to have an issue to encourage more men to come to the courses as it's mostly females who are coming. If we ask the people, is it easy to understand? 99% think the courses are easy to understand and most of the people do recommend the courses to others too. So this works really on the community level. Yeah, when COVID struck this year, we had the problem, we couldn't do usual last eight courses anymore. And then we had a discussion. We invited our most experienced instructors to participate in a working group. And then we established an online format of the last eight course within just four weeks. And uh, we have pilot tested it within the last month and with 174 participants. And interestingly, you can say it does work online. We, were, we weren't sure that, that this was the case, but most people really appreciate it also online and it does work. And uh, the other interesting finding was that we probably see other people attending. So that's more younger people would, would attend an online course. And on the other hand, people taking care of others in their own home would have the possibility to join because they cannot leave their own home. So this is really interesting and we are we're having ongoing research on that. Yeah, so if we would learn, if I would try to summarize what do we already know about our last eight courses, I can say we have proven that the last eight course is feasible. It's really well accepted by the citizens. Most of the participants, both children and adults and the people who attended the online course would recommend it to others and found the, found the contents really easy to understand. At present, we can say last air courses have been implemented in many countries. We have 18 countries already. Children like the last aid course, so it's feasible for children too. And the online, the online course has been tested. So um, I said already, it's mostly women attending. So um, this leads over to, we have to do more research on the case. And at present there is ongoing research and we already have established a large, which is a last aid research group, which originally was, was from Europe, but already has extended to other countries around the world. 
And at present, we are looking on a long-term follow-up. So we would like to follow the people after the course and would see how is it influencing? Does it, does it really make end-of-life care better at home or does it probably increase the number of home deaths? That is what we don't know at present, but what we are really interested in. And in order to do so, we have to do qualitative and quantitative evaluation. So we are planning a follow-up study where we are especially looking at people taking online courses and people taking care for others in their own home. Yeah, as I said before, we have an international cooperation to do the last eight courses and we have 18 countries doing that. So that's what I was, what I wanted to say. And I guess then we have good time for some questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Professor uh, George, uh, for your wonderful presentation. Yeah, Professor Fitcher, uh, if you have any question, I can go ahead and ask. That was excellent. I, um, it's interesting also, I assume the course for the kids and teens are, is a little bit different. It's geared a little bit different. Yeah, you can say it's it's about the same length. It's about it has also four modules with forty five minutes each, but it's of course a bit more playful. So we so we do okay. have a, we do have games, and as we have to to acknowledge the modern times, it's each module has one YouTube video in it. So, and it would be interesting to see if it um, if it influences changes in advanced directives. Yeah, that, that's what we actually want to do is to see the long term. What, what we know by now is that we have some questionnaires and we have some interviews from participants, but this is just right after the course. So we do have to know more about long term, long term effects. So is it really like that, that, that it could increase home death or that it empowers the people to provide palliative care at the end of life? There are some indicators that, that point in this direction, but we don't know for sure. Very interesting. Yeah. So, Dr. Fetcher, you have any question? Yes. Um, I would be interested. Uh, I learned um, students in the time between 12 and 17 are very vulnerable with these themes. Is this your uh, experience too or not? Absolutely not, I would say, because it was really interesting when we started. We were afraid to see some reactions or something like that. But if you ask, we, we actually asked the people, we asked the pupils in the, we have a questionnaire also if they had experience with death. And more than 80% said that they had experience with death. And many of them stated it was so good to talk about death and dying because we're not allowed to do that at home. So it's, re it's really obvious that, that they want to talk about it, but it looks like the adults block it. That's our impression at least. Hello, it's Melissa here from Canada. I just wanted to say it was really good as well. And um, I just wanted to add to that about um, Mr. Fisher asking about the teenagers. We run a bereavement camp here and it goes up to age 17 as well. And they say the exact same things that you were just mentioning about how they don't get to talk about at home and it makes them more comfortable. And it actually changes, like a weight has been lifted off their shoulders as far as how they cope in life in general so yeah it was really yeah. interesting because we asked the we asked the people also if they want to do the course together with with their parents and that there was there was instantly they said most of them said no way but our parents <laughs> should visit the last aid course for adults so that we can talk thereafter yeah thank you yeah thank you for the questions thank you thank you professor.